Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And... Because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Age of Radio. They were a young married couple experiencing the joys of owning their first home. Until one fateful day, some house guests showed up unexpectedly. John Lehrer getting Kirstie Alley star in Madhouse. That's right, it's a crossover from Cheers and Night Court, guest starring SNL's own weekend update anchor, Dennis Miller. This shit is horrifying, babe. Cha cha cha. That's Madhouse coming this summer from Dirt to Dirt Pictures. You know when I pick a movie, that's when I'm on to pressure now. The question always comes back to me, what will they think? Welcome, welcome, welcome back, folks, uh, to What Were They Thinking, a podcast about bad to questionable movies. And, uh, oh, this week's uh, got it in spades, I'll tell you. Um, talking this uh, week about the 1990 Kirstie Alley, John Larroquette, Tour de Force, Madhouse. Uh, of course, I can't do this sort of thing alone. I, of course, am one of your co-hosts, Nathan, with me as always um is the uh Dennis Miller to my John Larroquette I I barely remembered characters um this is so broad we can't Brendan how you doing hey babe I don't <laughs> think you could call them broads anymore <laughs> cha, 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 cha. because everyone will cancel you right Dennis <laughs> that's right that's the only reason I would ever get canceled <laughs> <laughs> Listen, yeah. Dennis Miller's barely in this movie, and that's my first biggest flaw. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to get a lot more Dennis, but this is no not a bordello of blood situation. Yes, I am Brendan. How's everyone doing? Uh, I would like a response, please. Okay, great. Okay, you in the back. Shut up. Sit yeah. Down. Hey, you know what? You know what? There there isn't like an official dress code, but come on. I mean, you're gonna. I mean. Would you go to your mom's place dressed like that? Yeah, really though. I do appreciate that the left and the right side though, like like one of them is, uh, you know, a few of them on the left side are wearing Crips shirts and a few of them on the right side are wearing Bloods shirts. Like that's a smart idea. That's clever. That's fun. It's weird that they showed up for the, you know, our 
take on Madhouse it, and not something like, I don't know, don't be a menace of South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. I mean, they likes what they likes. Podcasting I, no, yeah, will no. unite us all. Not going to yuck your yum. So, there you go. <laughs> not no, going to uh, yum your yuck either. Ooh. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, we're talking about 1990s Madhouse. Um, you know, this one was produced by Orion Pictures. Just another reason why they... Went uh, in the toilet there for quite some time Wait, and are only now back. This wasn't a smash hit. <laughs> oh my god! You you'd think with the uh, the uh, you know the like we got. Let's see, we got Kirstie Alley in it. We got, like I said, Lara Cut, Dennis Miller's in there. Uh, the Paper Chase guys in there. Um, yeah, that's about it. I don't really know <laughs> m- many people in this movie. I'll be honest with you. I you know I saw this movie when I was a kid. Uh, it was probably one of the, you know, getting into that, you know, those edgier, more adult type comedies. Although again, I'd been watching slasher movies since I was seven. Uh, but I was a big fan of Night Court, big fan of Cheers. Um, so Kirstie Alley, John Larroquette in the same movie. I was like, I've got to see this movie. And, and, you know, I didn't, didn't pay attention oh, to critics or anything at the time. Cause I, I would have been 12. You know, I only just maybe started listening to or watching at the movies like that year or a year later. So it didn't really matter. Or I suppose it wouldn't have, it, it would have mattered, but I didn't know how terribly badly this movie was being received. I probably would have avoided it. But when I was a kid, I didn't. I rented it and uh, yeah, watched it. And my, I think my 12 year old brain thought it was hilarious. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, because yeah. it's that's that it's that kind of humor. I mean, it's it's probably going for that demographic a bit, I would say. Um, yeah, this is also directed by uh, the Tom Ropalewski. I think that's how you pronounce Ropalowski? it. Ropalowski. Well, there's a yeah. L-E-W. I think it's Ropalewski. Yeah. But he also directed okay. another Kirstie Alley movie called Loverboy and The Next Best Thing starring Madonna and Rupert Everett and The Kiss uh which i don't know what that Wait, is what rupert everett and madonna in a movie yep okay <laughs> all right um and if- i i would be i i'd be less surprised if it was rupert murdoch and madonna in a movie maybe <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry i think he uh he he wrote that movie my my mistake oh. now it's much more believable um <laughs> And he also, of course, directed and wrote uh, the, the the famed classic "Look Who's Talking Now," where the dogs talk. So oh, he's the, the the dog one with the with Devito. He works with Kirstie Alley a he lot. He worked with Kirstie Alley like three other times as either a director mm-hmm. or a screenwriter. So I'm just saying, I'm gonna put the rumor out there now. You know, God rest your soul. But I think there's something going on with these two. Yeah. I mean, she wasn't always awful. So. <laughs> Well, she at least wasn't outwardly. <laughs> right, like, suppose <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, so you, 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 you advance in age. Like, I find with a lot of folks, you, you, uh, you start out a lot of times. You'll start out as a liberal, start getting more and more conservative as you get older, and then like by the time you get to your, you know, forties, fifties, you're watching Fox. <laughs> if you know, for a lot of people. That's yeah. just been my experience. I would say, well, I would say certainly for people who grew who grew up in that era. I think people now, yeah. as they get older, maybe not as much, but no, I think I, I, that's, I think that's give it time, give it time. Yeah, I just, I don't, I guess, I just mean because like not in as this... people get older, they, they want, uh, they, they want that, that weird sense of safety that they think conservatism brings. Right, but I just mean I think right now we're living not in a time of a lot of conserv conservatism's not the same that it was then. So I think the people that are Oh, n- no, but I still feel that the uh the advancement the way it goes is uh, unless you know you're one of those folks who was like born and bred you know, in, in like a and like a hardcore right wing as that would be a madhouse and and we're here that to talk about a madhouse. madhouse not not uh not a madhouse um, right yeah yeah okay so um this movie and uh, like i said uh, has a it does have a lot of uh of a broad comedy almost um 
sitcom esque mm. um, for a lot of the stuff that happens in this movie, and like so much so that even it had prob I would say probably been twenty years or more since I've seen this movie last. Okay. So like the only things that really stuck with me big time were like I had the cat throwing up, the house guests that wouldn't leave. And Dennis Miller and John Larroquette were buddies. Those were the things that stuck with me. And so it was still, I was, it wasn't completely fresh, but almost like watching it fresh. And I was still able to basically write the jokes, not because I was remembering them from when they happened, but because it's so formulaic. Oh, yeah. It, uh, yeah, but, it's, it's, yeah. So, oh, sorry. You're going to tell us briefly I'm what. I'm going to get. I'm going to get to that. Yep. I'm going to get to the, the, the very most important. I got to get to the plot. That's right. Brent, the plot. Um, Christy Allen and John Larroquette are, you know, they're new homeowners, young, uh, yuppie couple, Mm. uh, bought their first home, um, out in the Valley, I guess. Uh, and they're enjoying it. Uh, come, you know, that's, it's a starter home for them. Uh, the, the, the toilet needs to jiggle the handle and stuff, which is, you know, that's a comedy trope from the 80s and 90s if I ever saw one. Mm-hmm. Then family members come to visit. And then another family member comes to visit. And then they have to take in other people. So, and these people refuse to leave. Of course, they lose control of their house or like the, their surrounding. It's it devolves into absolute chaos. There are, are cats and snakes living together. It's mass bedlam. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. So, and I guess hilarity ensues. It attempts to ensue. Yeah. There's a uh, lot I of mean... there's a lot of falling down. There's a lot of pratfalls. It's like it's it's like I said, it's very, very broad. You get a lot of like uh, that slapsticky, easy joke, easy. I guess going for the easy laugh stuff. Very um, yeah. A lot of tropes. A lot of tropes. A lot of a lot of casual. Um, I know you said 1990, but there's a lot of casual 80s racism as is the, as is the style. Yes, <laughs> especially oh. when we meet Kirstie Alley's sister with the Middle oh Eastern God. husband. I. Oof. Like I thought, okay. I forgot. I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah. Well, I okay. The first <laughs> time she says the one slur, I was like, okay, I'm not surprised. Whatever. Like, let's just move on. But then she just keeps going to town. Like, there's just one after the other, like yeah. nonstop. Like she's like, it reminded me of uh, Billy Barty and <laughs> oh, and body slam, body slam. Yeah, just yeah. going at her. Oof. Um, but Nathan, I gotta say right off the bat. This movie was made me uncomfortable because um, they start out having this couple with a new house. And I was like, oh, okay. This is kind of like where I was at not that long ago. And then they have the issues at the toilet right away. And I was like, oh, fuck you, movie. Do you have a camera in my home? <laughs> <laughs> that was actually, I mean, honest to goodness, that was a thing I saw in like I, I countless amounts of comedies and sitcoms oh, yeah. on, on TV and in movies in the 80s and 90s. And legitimately had a couple of relatives that I could think of off the top of my head where we had to, and I quote, jiggle the handle every time you flush the toilet. Yeah. Well, and isn't it weird too, though? Like, because I expected there to be a big payoff to that. And really, I mean, the ending scene, I guess, but I, I expected, like, you know, someone to go in there and fucking just shit to fly everywhere or something. Like, you know, it's not something like. Or that the toilet would cause like a flood and like, yeah. that, like it would like break through like Breaking Bad style through the floor or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, if it, <laughs> the other movie, I don't know why I thought of this specific sequel to a movie, but for some reason I thought of like Meet the Fockers. And the reason it's that specifically is because it's when they go to like Ben Stiller, they go to his dad's house. It's like Dustin Hoffman. And he says, uh, if it's yellow, let it mellow. And if it's brown, flush it down. Flush it down. Yeah. And I was like, that that trope has been around for so long. Yes. And, okay, so, I mean, let's get right into the, the whole, the, the tropes. Because, I mean, first of all, like I said, they're a yuppie couple. So they're very materialistic. So and very unlikable. Very much so, but... 
a lot of people were like that in the 80s. I mean, and I know this yeah. is a 1990, but I mean, come on, this it's is an a, 80s. It's an 80s movie. This was probably Damn. filmed in like 87 and delayed because this had all the trappings of an of a mid 80s movie. Like this did not yeah. look like 1990 at all. Now this this whole thing is reeks of Reagan. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yuppie because, yuppie I mean, yuppie. Spend spend yeah. spend. Yuppies, they they're obsessed with their cars. They have his and hers cars. Uh no, they have hers and mine cars. Oh right. Because that's what, yeah, that's their 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 vanity license plates are hers and mine. So clearly, not hers and his. Yeah, which which is odd that it wouldn't just be hers and his. Now I I, I just assumed that's what it was. And I guess I don't know. This is it. It, it was that thing in the eighties where you know folks. Kind of that the value that ideal of success because hmm. I mean as as shitty as Ronald Reagan was, eighties uh Reagan era and even you know the first two terms of Bush, that that was a boom time a boom time rather for uh not just the US but for all Western countries. Mm-hmm. Like people were making money snorting coke, watching Saturday morning cartoons. It was it was quite the age to be alive, I'll tell you. The only thing you, you you had to remember is when your shows were on and how to set the VCR because nothing was streaming because the internet was not a thing uh, for commercial users. Well, you had to have cocaine because the same people who were watching those early Saturday morning cartoons were watching Saturday Night Live, so they had to stay up for a long time on Saturdays. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, and, and just the... I love it too in these movies that another trope is like the places where they work. It's always like, it's either like a law firm or it's stocks or it's something like corporate. And well, I love it. It's news and yeah. Uh, hedge. I think it's hedge funds. Yeah. Yeah. But they always make it like just vague enough that you, that you don't like really question anything. Like it's so that you can just use, say things like, I I want that quarterly projection on my desk in the morning right well it's even even in like you know much better movies like christmas vacation i mean it's even pretty vague where he works other than like you know it's an insurance or whatever uh, no, stock he, wor- he works he, no he doesn't he works at like uh food preservatives oh see i didn't even okay yeah because see, there's a, one point he's he's ha- he's eating some of their food and he's this is christmas vacation of course he's eating some of the food and he's like i'm i'm i'm, I'm. Because the whole idea is that the products that he they create are so jammed packed with preservatives that the food will last forever, but it tastes terrible and it's barely edible. Wow, I do not remember that at all, and I've seen that movie eight million times. Uh, when Brian Doyle Murray is is telling him about the, the preservatives, yeah, type something up for me. None of that inside baseball crap. Something that everyone can understand. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so but there's madhouse. There, yeah, there's 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 so there's so many of these tropes, and and I mean, and then Dennis Miller literally walking, almost walking right from the set of Weekend Update, like he just his so hair so looks... much so that he has to even mention Chernobyl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like was, he yeah. because at this point we found out that uh, uh, John Larroquette's cousin Freddie, I remember Freddie's name, but I don't remember John's off the top of my head. I think it's Mark or something. It's, I mean, when someone is like that recognizable when you've seen them in so much stuff, it's John Larroquette. It's Kirstie yeah. Alley. It's really it, it hard. Just, folks, be glad I'm not calling him Dan Fielding, okay? <laughs> so, anyways, Freddie's going to show up. They're supposed to be staying for five days. And he's like, what's the worst thing, what's the worst that could happen or what's the worst they could do in five days? And of course, Miller's got to get Chernobyl out in five minutes, babe. Ja, ja, ja. <laughs> right, yeah. Dennis... And then we meet the cigar chomping boss who wants his hedge fund managed, and they need to get those projections on the desk so they can get to the bell going and the sounding and the stocks and the up and the, the down. <laughs> I mean, I think that's an exact quote from the movie. I'm pretty sure. I'm just pulling the script here. Let me just see. Um, you said the up and the down, right? Yeah, man, and the bell going with the stocks and the up and the down. Let me just do a quick control F and type that in. Let's see here. Oh, the, right on the nose, Nathan. Word you for got words. It. Word I've for seen words. like yeah, I've seen it a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that stuck out to me early on was, I, I, first of all, I think they were both ter- they're both terrible. <laughs> <laughs> like throughout the movie, okay, they, there's a couple times where I'm like, okay, I get their frustration, but they're kind of bad. And the weird thing is that they're terrible, 
but they're not so terrible that they won't say get the fuck out of our house that didn't and that didn't make sense to me because i'm like you people are obviously not good people <laughs> like just get them out but the thing is okay so the the whole setup to this is that his cousin is like is gonna stay with them his cousin they're uh, john larket's cousin and wife wild cousin he was such a wild man back in the day yeah and what i one thing that stuck out to me early is kirstie alley is like a newscaster or she has like a segment on the news she's a question girl though she's a really dignified title (laughs) right i was like god damn it (laughs) but she's yeah because they they cut every now and then to a bunch of montages of her just like asking people like what would you do for a million dollars? Like that kind of thing. What's your What's your secret summer fantasy? Yeah, and of course. You know, date with Tom Cruise. A date with Tom Cruise. One's get a it? Guy, one's a girl. See? Yeah. You Cause get it? Because it's California, and there are gay people there. <laughs> Nowhere else in America, though. No, just... not in Reagan's America. <laughs> just... Only in that loony lefty California, <laughs> and maybe down in the you know the. The lower ends of New York in the in the village. Reagan got an early screening of this movie for the White House and was like, well, maybe we should edit out that part. <laughs> what do you think, mummy? <laughs> yeah. What, what a weird thing. What a weird thing to be gay. Oh, that's so weird. Right, mommy? My wife? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I need to throw a bunch of racial epithets that I hope people don't catch on tape. And I'll make sure not to mention AIDS. <laughs> Um, Cause that's not a thing that doesn't exist. But but Matt awful. Adam. He was a fucking. Tra- it's you know the weird thing is, with the, the whole thing with the Trumpster fire, uh, from a few years ago, made me pine for the days of Reagan, and I fucking hate that guy. Yeah, when people said like, "Oh man, Trump is no Reagan," that is a, br- a brutal insult. <laughs> yeah. That is like, oh, Trump is no bag of shit. He's a worse (laughs) bag of shit. He's way worse than Reagan, yeah. That's bad, guys. That's real bad. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so when, so she has her question girl segment, and my thing was, John Larroquette shows up at at the station when she's in the midst of having an interview about getting promoted, and he's like, but it's like nothing important. Knock, 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 knock. Knock, 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 knock. Yeah. I'm going to go pick up my cousin at the airport. It's like... Both of us need to be there. Right. I was like, you can just be there, dude. Like, she doesn't need to... And then she comes out saying, like, you know, oh, you just... uh, That that was my interview to get promoted. And he's like, yeah, yeah, honey, but come on. We got to make good. We got to make it look good. And I'm like, you're a dick. (laughs) The dude in the 80s, because, you know, the, the, the wife's job didn't matter at the time. I'm actually surprised Kirstie Alley's character has a job in this movie, to be honest with you. Well, what I mean, I mean, we're in the we're 1990. We're coming up on the career woman. Well, I mean, uh, I would say the I mean, Working Girl was what 86. Yeah, yeah. Is that the is that the S- one with the uh... Sigourney Weaver? Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen it. So it's 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 right. It's it's it would have been for about five, four or five years previous okay so the idea of her being a you know a professionally upwardly mobile woman like that doesn't spell yuppie but you get what i'm saying right uh a woman with not, a career a woman with a career was uh was while still uh <laughs> uh uh the the target for several hacky stand-up comedians at the time was becoming to be not a very uncommon thing Right. I do notice, though, and I guess that this movie negates that in one scene when Kirstie Alley does a strip tease where I was like, oh, OK. But um, in a lot of these movies, if the woman is a career woman, she often wears like huge shoulder pads in a suit and she doesn't really get to be sexy. She, Well, I mean, she got to wear the shoulder pads and suit because I remember a couple times when she was on the uh, the news, I was like, Jesus, they give her Mean Joe Green's shoulder pads to put under that thing? Oh, no, they definitely do it in this movie. But I just mean, like, I was surprised they gave her that sexy bit later. Uh, they well, still went with that. I mean, I mean it's, it's Kirstie Alley. It's Kirstie Alley. And it's like, it's 80s Kirstie Alley, too. Yeah. I mean... I will Ooh. say, you know, <laughs> you know, obviously R.I.P. She just passed, like, I think, like, last year or something. Yes. Maybe, um, like, you know, she had some ch- shitty views. But... Uh, the thing is with the Kirstie Alley, I find, and in this movie too, it's like she can, she didn't have a problem making herself look goofy or bad or even like kind of gross. And not that she's gross, but you know, to gross herself up for a laugh. No, she, 
she she is and I mean not even so much I mean the same with Laraquette. I yeah. mean both of them they get the assignment, they understand the assignment, they know that, you know, uh this character's not always gonna have dignity, so yeah, I'm just gonna need to roll with it. Right. You know, and it it sucks when you see people who you can tell that they're super uncomfortable doing that, but they still have to do it for like a, a show and it's like they're they're you could tell they're like just gritting their teeth to get through it. Yeah. But I mean these both of these guys do it with just absolute oh, they just it, it they don't skip a beat. Nope. Like later on when they are both a disheveled disaster of a couple, they it you know, there's there's no holding back. Everything it's oh beautiful but the house guests yes from new jersey um J- john larroquette's cousin freddie who uh, used to be named ever ready freddie and what we see him is almost daddy freddie uh because he's been so henpecked and uh you know just bl- <laughs> i don't want to say bludgeoned verbally to death by this sh- harpy of a wife of his because they they've got to make her out to be the, the the bad person because I mean, I mean for lack of a better terms, she's a villain in this movie. Yeah, well she he had even though I don't think there's a single good person in this there, movie. There isn't. There <laughs> really isn't. The only character that gets a redemption arc is the cat. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean. Freddy learns to stand up for himself, I guess. But I mean, Freddy. So Freddy is like, he, he's set up as this guy that John Larroquette's like, oh, you used to have a crazy life and you used to like get all the ladies and stuff. And there's see, but the movie frames it as like, and I know she's supposed to be like worse than this, but it's like, oh man, this girl made him settle down and get a job and live. Like, oh, what a shrill mess of a wife. <laughs> well, he, he being Freddy. Uh, pronouns, pal. He says that um, when Larry Kett's talking to him about like how he used to be, like you could have any girl in high school. Uh, you were on this team. You had all this confidence, you know. And he's like, yeah, somewhere between uh graduation and September of the following year, it all fell apart. And I'm like, Jesus, that is a harrowing life tale. Yeah, that's a deep, like, it, quick depression. You, I mean, there's peaked in high school, and then there is, like, bottomed out after high school was r- over immediately. Yeah, listen, the bully the bully in high school usually ends up in jail, but not usually two months after they graduate. <laughs> so, and, I mean, the, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, he, you've, obviously you're meant to feel sorry for Freddy because he does the way Lara Kett makes him out to be that it sounds like he was, you know, he was a really great guy, a fun guy to be with. And, and you know what, we should really, you know, we should really feel bad for him. But then I immediately stopped feeling bad for him because, well, he keeps calling John Lara Kett Pudge and then decides to show all these home movies where he's a fat kid. And everybody has this huge laugh about how, you know, uh, they used to pretend he was afloat in the Macy's Day Parade. Oh, here's a video of him just eating handfuls and handfuls of cake. Isn't that hilarious? Don't you feel good about yourself now, cousin? I'm glad I came to visit you. That was awful. And also, two things. Kirstie Alley was laughing her ass off at it as well. And number two, did they bring that tape? or did? Yes, he, he brought those okay. home movies. Because at one point, because when they're watching it, he asks Freddie, you know, how many, you know, how many did you bring? He's like, you know, only 10 or 12, something like that. Okay, because I, I must have missed that because when they played that video, I was like, why would Lara Kett keep these home videos? These are <laughs> horrifying. Like Those are all Freddy's. I'm surprised he doesn't have, like, severe uh, self-esteem issues. He, well, I mean, he's constantly working out. That's true. I mean, there's there's all kinds of like stuff that that indicates that he he's still he's still dealing with that whole thing, and I mean, granted, he does stand up to him a bit and tells him to stop calling him Pudge because he's not Pudgy that little kid anymore. But you know, Freddie doesn't do any better. He's like, oh, "I'll call you Stretch because you ta- you 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 thinned out as you as you got taller." Right. It's like yeah, or don't you just can... fucking just call him Mark, asshole. Yeah, just call me Mark or bro or brother or something. Buzz. Cousin, 
It's oh, whatever. I guess, yeah, he's his cousin. Sorry. Um, okay, never mind. I take it all back. Everything worked as perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the oh, real oh, star. Fred is also Ed Norton. He, not And not uh, not Edward Norton. Ed Norton from The Honeymooners. He, he used to work in the sewers and would just claim things that came down the pipe and clean them up. He does look like that, actually. He do- no, that's what he does. He he says oh, like he lost his job no, doing that. Right. No, but I'm I'm saying that I think Fred kind of looked like him a little bit. Oh, like Ed Norton. From yeah. The Honeymooners. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. That's his. That's a dream. How job. you do them, Marky boy? The real Get star. these nice watches. The real star of this couple is their cat. Anyway. Uh, oh my god. Which <laughs> it. it uh, so you know what? I think this was just. The, I thought this movie was going to become Pet Cemetery, because they kept. <laughs> The cat keeps dying, getting buried, and coming back to life. The best part about all of that, like, when we first meet the cat, it gets gets car sick. It throws up all in the car. It's disgusting. Patty was almost sick herself in that scene. The cat almost, as soon as they get home from the airport, the cat almost dies and dies, and they have to bury it. And then the Patty's like, whoa. And then the cat goes back to life, and she's like, "Jesus, is this pet cemetery?" And I'm like, "You know what? This kind of is a horror movie." And I hadn't, I haven't seen Mother. And then when you said this is basically Mother if it was a sitcom, mm-hmm. I was like, "This makes perfect sense because they bury this cat four times at least." Yeah, not to mention no, they bury bury it three times, and it goes to the evidence locker once. Not to mention later when a kid who I do believe becomes Jeffrey Dahmer later in oh life. Oh my god! Is that chasing kid. it with a fucking bat, and then Chase tries he, to put it in a microwave. Doesn't he run over it with a lawnmower? Uh, no, he's cha- he chases it with a lawnmower after actually it hasn't come back to life yet, which was you know a weird editing thing. He uh, he kills but he it does somehow. Blow though. it up. Yeah, he blows it up. Yeah. He, he the kid is the next door neighbor's kid. Now we're gonna talk because these all these people we're talking about end up being house guests we haven't even touched on christy alley's sister yet who is oh boy i'm i'm really i guess i'm surprised that they didn't make uh christy alley and her sister jewish because <laughs> there's a lot of jokes about them getting a nose job right from from the uh, from bernice that's bernice yeah uh y- that's yeah, that's Freddie's yeah, wife. Yeah, uh, Fred's wife keeps because she's like, because I'm a beauty expert, and it looks like you got a little, little, little snip, snip, just a little one. It's not too perfect. In fact, they left one of the nostrils too, a little too big. Right. And but the idea, like, because when we meet her sister, she has been kicked out or she has left, depending on you know which version of the story you hear in the movie. Uh, she's left her uh, Middle Eastern. I guess oil baron husband. I'm assuming because the joke is that she's she's basically like Anna Nicole Smith. She's going after all these older men and or just rich men in general because yeah. you know when she starts kind of trying to lay out you know who she's gonna land for her new man. She's got a whole list of people and they ask why do you got all stars next to their names? So those ones are over eighty. Right, right. But she, I, I'm surprised they didn't because it, it seems like you know that perfect lazy 80s comedy that they could have just snatched straight up by making uh the making her jewish which by the fact would make christy alley jewish but she's married uh to an arab man right so i mean there's all kinds of like lazy 80s comedy you could mine there who by the way we never see on screen no no we don't we hear a voice and i've got a feeling it wasn't (laughs) Yeah, I, I also have a feeling he wasn't really speaking Farsi. No. I, I, I just, and I have the feeling that it was just a white guy speaking gibberish. I, I did enjoy the fact that uh, another character who we never see but only hear a voice of is the doctor for Bernice. Mm. Um, his voice is done by a doctor of with the same name, but he's a, a dental surgeon. Right. In the credits, he's listed as Dr... What was his name? I can't even remember now. Wait, they it's, were, it's they were... performed performed by an actual doctor. Yeah, yeah, he's I, I'm uh, uh, Jack Panix, E N E X, Doctor Panix. Oh right. Uh, Ob his character is credited in the credits as Jack Panix Panix O B G Y N 
played by Dr. Jack Penix, DDS. So he's played by a dentist. I'm guessing he, he knew somebody in production, and they were like, this would be hilarious. Like, my buddy Jack, he'll he'll do it. It'll be hilarious. Well, like, he'll love it. Also hilarious is that they pronounce it Penix. What's that close to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's an OBGYN. <laughs> derp to diddly derp. Yeah. So... Yeah, because, oh, oh, yeah, we, um, but yeah, she's sorry. She's pregnant. Bernice is pregnant. Bernice is pregnant. Well, yeah, as far she as. She says she's pregnant. As right. far as we know. Spoiler alert. <laughs> well, but uh, the thing is, too, like, when she says she's pregnant and, you know, there's the moment where they're about to leave and Kirstie Alley accidentally knocks her down, I was like, and she's like screaming in pain. I'm like, this is horrifying. It's a miscarriage as a comedy, like a like possible miscarriage as like a joke, as like, a comedy beat. Yep. Yeah, it, like, and then later there's like a, a well, I, there's a there's a moment where Lara Kett is hit on by a very young girl for like. Well, a I was second. actually I was I was just about to get to that because yeah. now that we've covered the cousins, right? Or the cousin and the wife, and the sister who shows up. She is now in another house guest, so we've got three house guests now. Uh, the next door neighbor, who is played by the paper chase guy, um, the Warrior of the Lost World. If anybody's getting any of these Mystery Science Theater oh, references, I know Warrior of the Lost World. <laughs> he was the guy driving the motorcycle. He yeah. was the hero in that. Yeah, great uh, film. <laughs> and uh, his family, they live next door. Uh, he's got the aforementioned sociopath son. Uh, named uh, CK. Oh, sorry. Who says who says it stands for confirmed kills? Although I think I might change it to cat killer. He's a sociopath. He is going to be a serial killer. Dahmer, or he's going to be like you know Gacy Ramirez. Take your pick. Well, I think Dahmer, this... like very specifically, was torturing like small animals. So I think that's why my it's, mind went to Dahmer. It's 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 one of the red flags. The, the in hair general. too. The hair. There. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, he's got his his uh, Lolita wannabe daughter, who yep. is constantly hitting on Lara Kett, saying shit like, I got my first period, and she's doing all these, like, gymnast stretches and bouncing on the trampoline. And it's it's very, I mean, <sighs> disconcerting. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that it, it's, it, it got made then. I don't know. Do you think they would tackle it with this kind of, or do you think they would rewrite that character if they made a movie like this now? I don't know. You see, the weird thing to me is that it's a pretty open, it's a pretty open secret of the shit that goes on in Hollywood. So whenever I see this kind of thing in a movie, it, it's extra weird because I'm like, I'm like, there's a good chance there are at least like five, six producers behind the scenes that are like, Haha, I'd, I'd nail that. Right, right, Benny? <laughs> I like the worst part of it is right, guarantee you, there's a there's a at one point the director or someone was like, Come on, make it sexier, sexier. That's another um, thing too. It's like when Let we, me let me finish my math homework first. <laughs> it's like when we watch Carpool, like I can only imagine when she has to do that walk and he's like, Can you do it slower and more revealing? It's like, dude, she's fucking sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. I'm just saying it's weird. <laughs> but you know what? A t- uh, possible statutory rape is hilarious, I guess. So let's, I mean, let's just run down the, the, the trope count that we have here now. We've got uh, yuppies. Yeah. Um, we have got um, Jersey Jersey Shore uh, white trash. I don't want to be too mean, but I mean, let's call it what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, cigar chomping client. Material obsessed sister married to an uh, an Arab oil magnate, which like I mean, it could have just as well been just like an old rich guy, but they decided to go the more the more racial route, right? <laughs> uh, a dude bro next door neighbor who thinks that uh, I mean, in the parlance of our times, that John Larroquette is a cuck. Wait, is there a single person <laughs> of color in this movie? Hmm. With lines, in the, in the in the in the montages. Okay, but no dialogue. No, 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 no main characters. No. Okay. So the one no. character, Madhouse, so white. Yes, hashtag Madhouse, so white. <laughs> well, the one character that's not white that we hear is off screen. 
Yes. <laughs> oh, 1990. And then, as I said before, not only the dude, bro, but the um, uh, the the kid who is, who thinks who killing animals is played for yucks, and the and the then the Lolita daughter of the next door neighbor. That's the thing. Like, I know that I know that like there's comedies where you know animals get hurt and it's goofy and it's like not meant to be taken super seriously. But this movie, it just seems meaner. Like, because you see the kid actively chasing and trying to kill a cat, and it's like and right. It's so, like at the at the first, it's it's the first couple times the cat unfortunately dies or almost dies, I guess. It's through misadventure. Right. But by the end of it, this kid is actively trying to kill the cat, like blowing up its water dish. And yeah. like, there's a, there, and you know what? The the thing about this movie is like, we're barely talking about the plot, <laughs> but you can't, like, there's so much to talk about, about how unlikable every single person in this movie is. The only person who I kind of was like, hey, all right, other than, you know, you know, Freddie getting his own groove back by becoming a carny was the cop who slapped that kid in the back of the head at the end of the movie. Right. Because she's going to be his new mom. Right. Because her dad, the Lotus dealer. He was OK. I will say he was OK. He wasn't that Ginty, bad. Robert Ginty, I think his name is. The neighbor who's got the kid, who's got the Lolita daughter and the psycho uh, son is not too, too bad. And I actually kind of think he is the only really justified person for living in that house. Because Lara Kett, I mean, it's an accident. Burns but his house still, down. It's by accident. Still yeah. burns his fucking house down. So, and I mean, he's building them like, uh, ble- he's, I love how as soon as he gets in the house, he's like building like bleachers and like ramps. Oh, and I, because like when he, like he's woodworking and that's like his, I guess that's his Zen. That's the thing he does to unwind because right. he works as a, a car dealer uh, and he's trying to sell uh, Lotus cars that have people who are not in, in the know. Uh, they are very high-end uh, sports cars uh, that cost a lot, a lot of money. Um, so, I mean, trying to make a living at that uh, would definitely be a very high-pressure and stressful situation. I mean, um, so to unwind, he builds, he does woodworking. So there's piles and piles of sawdust in his garage. That's what starts the whole thing. When his house burns down because John Larroquette and them are celebrating because they they think everybody's finally going to leave because... Kirstie Alley hooks her sister up with him. Yeah. And so they're kind of celebrating that they're going to get rid of her and they're going to get rid of Jonathan, the nephew, because that's he's a whole other kettle of fish because that's another house guest that shows up to, to take up space in their house. Uh, They I don't know how somehow like managed to like accidentally kick their barbecue and it rolls all the way across their backyard it's... tips over and it goes into the guy's garage, which ignites the... It, it's a very Rube Goldberg-esque oh. uh, <laughs> Man, situation. it's super convoluted is what it is. Like, it just... It's like... It, yeah, exactly. Rube Goldberg. It's like one thing had to happen at the perfect moment for this to happen, and then this to happen, and then this to happen. It's like, come on. Like, I know I'm watching a dumb comedy, but, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But, yeah, then eventually just everyone's in the house. You mentioned Jonathan. I guess you probably yes. say who that guy is. Because I thought he was going to be my one guy that was like, okay, he's maybe he's okay. Yeah, because at first <sighs> he seems it. Because he's like, dad kicked me out. Or you're not dad, not his dad. I mean, it'd be his stepdad. Kicked me out too when when you left. So I, I hate to ask, but can I stay, you know, with you guys? He's more hat in hand and knows that he's putting them out. And so they they let him come in because you know, the mom's the mom's living there, and he even says to to Mark, who I mean, by this time he's sleeping on a mattress in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, can I get a? Can you? Would you be able to help me get a job? Because I I want to help because you guys are doing all this and and I want to be able to get a job so I can get my own place and get out. They're glad to hear it. Great. John Larroquette, Mark, whatever, goes out of his way to get him a job at Larroquette and Miller, whatever the name of the fucking hedge fund company they work at is. 
and gets him a job in the mailroom. You're like, okay, the kid's earning his he's earning his pay. He's uh, he's gonna save up. He's gonna move out. And he um he's a coke dealer. Yeah, well, it, yeah, <laughs> out of nowhere, like a goddamn RKO, like, like, like an RK blow. <laughs> uh, see, because the cocaine, you see, I got it. and probably Randy Orton did a bunch of cocaine. I'm guessing. What? I'm <laughs> he seems so level-headed to me. Yeah, he he is. His emotions seem very uh, sturdy. Um, yeah. yeah, so he ends up getting a bunch of like cocaine delivered to the mailroom with like uh, Mark's name on it, and then I guess that's like the big. That's like the big set piece towards the end, of the, near the end of the movie, where uh, he's trying to get rid of this stuff. And it's like fuck it, John Larroquette, just stop for a second. Go up to the boss and be like, look, dude, <laughs> I hired my nephew. Turns out he's into drugs. He's got a bo- he's got a friggin' box of coke in the thing. I'm just letting you know what happened. Um, let, but, let's just call the police and deal with this. I suppose that that might work in a sane situation, but the, <laughs> the nephew has this set up so that it's all coming to the company in Mark's name. Yeah. So he's like, and because he even says like when he when Mark confronts him about it, he's like, he's like, what the hell is this? And he's like, he's like, well, it's your name on the package, so I guess it's your cocaine, man. <laughs> can't, can't, but can't, you know, you gotta have that that mild '80s racism. You gotta get that in there. Because mm-hmm. I mean, we're we're done talking about the 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 oil magnate husband at this time, so you gotta figure out another way to get that quota. We all listen to the fact this is all happening over uh, 50 days, like almost two straight months. Freddie has ran away. Like after the there's a night where him and Lara Kett go out and they 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 kind of bond and they have that moment where, you know, Lara Kett's like, stop calling me Pudge. And then he reminds Freddie of all the good times that they did. What happened to you? Where's your confidence? And then they dance to a song that's in the jukebox to everybody's delight in the in the bar and the next day he wakes up and freddy's run away and we don't see him again until like i don't know fucking almost till the end where he shows up with an elephant because he's become a carny not since the reveal of tom arnold having a garage circus have i been more (laughs) surprised by a plot development also i'm thinking you know that dance that was a long dance that people just sat there and watched. But also, um, it's because it everybody was like, "Hey, I haven't seen folks rip off the Temptations in a while." <laughs> but it doesn't hold a candle to the Polar Bear Squad. The polar Bear Squad. Early on in the movie, they do this little. You think they're going to? Oh do this my little god! Handshake, yes, Camp Redfern. Polar yeah. Bear Squad, which culminates with cupping uh, the other person's balls or jiggling them, I guess. <laughs> That's his cousin. Well, you know, it's a little, little weird. A little weird. Seventies and eighties summer camp culture was wild, man. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna say that. Oh, sure, but I mean, normally it's not a family member. I, I don't. Mm. <laughs> it just was weird to me that it ended with you know them what? tickling I, each other's I, nuts. I don't. No, I, I refuse to talk about this further. You can speak to my lawyers. Oh, well, all right. Well, you know, it, it, hey, anyone out there tickling your families and balls, you know, just <laughs> it's cool, man. Just don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at at about day 12 of this 50 day odyssey, oh. um, they're sleeping in the kitchen on a mattress. Kirsty Alley, uh, Jesse, since I've now taken to calling John Larroquette by his character's name. Jesse um, is, uh, is no really kind of way to dance around this. She's nearly raped by a snake. And they yeah. murder the snake. They... And rightfully so. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know because that, that that seemed... I, I get grabbing the snake and even... I get even throwing oh, that, it out the... that's That, that snake was, was dead to begin with. I mean, there's no two ways that way that snake was reaching a natural end because look who its owner was. Well, that's a, well, th- that's what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say I would have even been okay if they had just thrown it out the window and let it, like, go off or whatever. But to th- put it in the blender is an extra step. But, yes, like you said, that snake is owned by Little Dahmer, so that snake is doomed. 
as soon as that snake outlives its worth, uh, that dead kid is going to kill it. And I don't think that snake is also a Terminator, unless in the world of this movie, every animal is <laughs> when they die are buried in a pet cemetery and just keep coming back to life. I also found out uh, this when I was uh, checking out the IMDb on this. Uh, Jonathan uh, played Philip in Nightmare on Elm Street 3. So he is in one of my favorite movies and not a total terrible person. So, I mean, good actor. Good, good actor. He's got range. Uh, Day 27, it's time to do something about these people. And this is when things really start turning dark for John Larroquette and Christy Alley. Because they're... John Larroquette's trying to, you know, send them all off to be Harry Krishnas mm. because he's on the phone saying, do they all have to shave their heads and hand out flowers at the airport? Get it? Because the Harry Krishnas did that in the 80s. And that joke ages like a fine wine because that happens all the time still. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they, uh, uh, and okay, so this is where Kirstie Alley has her uh, her on air meltdown because she has gone from asking people, "What's your um, you know, what's your what's your secret summertime fantasy?" to, "How would you murder somebody?" How did this pass before it got on the air? Because this is a recorded video. Are you telling me that no <laughs> one else watched this before it went on air? You know what? It's She's gone the eight o'clock news, and what do they say about the eight o'clock news? I don't. If it bleeds, it leads. But they are clearly not happy with this report, and no, this is not they're not happy with this report. She has an absolute on-air meltdown. She literally is t- like talking about house guests. I need them gone. How do you <laughs> murder someone? And I'm like. In, a, in any universe, this meltdown, she would not have gotten a second chance, number one. Number two, she probably would have went straight to a jail or, like, a home, <laughs> like, following well, Because this. she practically admits to it because she says, like, Drano in the bean dip, those people were up all night shitting and they refused to jiggle the handle. She literally admits to attempted murder Actively on the air. Actively attempted murder, exactly. Because because she's like, oh, you think you're just going to tap dance yourself into a pharmacy and get yourself some insulin like that doctor said? No. And, the, the, and then, of course, you know, she has her, they, they cut back to the, the poor anchor woman, uh, which, I mean, you know what? Kudos to this movie. Not a single dude behind the anchor desk. I was shocked. Um, and she's trying to deliver the news about what else is happening out in, you know, fucking San Bernardino and down in the valley and stuff like that. And Kirstie Alley's just wandering around in the background having her fucking psychotic break. Yeah. And then they give her a second chance. And this is where I got to take Kirstie Alley's side a little bit, though, because this is after the drug thing has happened and they find they find uh, Jonathan's uh, uh, drugs or they or they. they Sorry. Oh no no she she has a that she has another psychotic break and that's when she cuz that's when she sees all the stuff that's happening at the house because day 27 has the on air meltdown but the actual psychotic break it happens on it, around day 49 because i i i took notes by the day <laughs> well that's Every what i mean that- <laughs> that's what i mean like after this break they give her another chance and then day 49 she has a second break and this is when uh, John Larkett has already dealt with the drug stuff. He comes to his home. He finds Fred with the elephant. The cops show up. They see uh, they see the cat has ingested fucking cocaine and dies meow, again. Meow, 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 they, running circles on the front lawn. Yeah, fucking really died. My favorite parts of the movie. They see it and the cops are like, "It's a rock house." And it's a rock house. Which I didn't. I was like, <laughs> "Is that a term?" <laughs> it is. I've heard crack house. I've oh never god, heard Bre- rock house. Bre- did you? Oh my god! <sighs> I just, you know what but, I thought. But you know what I, I thought. I wish. I, I wish I could give you my active memories of the '80s, just so you could see how this stuff is ridiculous now with us talking about it. But things like the rock house and a cat doing coke were just things that would happen in TV and movies. All the time in the 80s. The cat thing didn't shock me, but the, the 
just calling it a rock house. I was like, because it was crack. My first thought. Well, I got that after. I actually had to look it up on Urban Dictionary, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but but then I um, I my first thought was like, oh, are these cops gonna like jam with them for a bit? <laughs> it's a rock house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he, had, he even had the, like the the like a. Phil Alfon or whatever, the dude from uh, Anthrax, shaved head and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were cool cops, like the dad in Vibrations. <laughs> <laughs> right. But this is her second breakdown. But this is, I'm going to say, completely understandable because she's on the yeah. news and it's her home. That's like it's the top home. story. Yeah. Nobody thought to say, hey, Kirstie Alley, we might want to tell you about this before we air it. <laughs> it's only that. Like, okay, like the cops are there. There's uh, like a helicopter overhead. The the kid who uh, we th- they thought oh he's gonna be a, a, an upstanding child now he's mowing a lawn he he carves a swear he carves fuck you into the lawn so the this apparently the cops take it as a personal attack and it enrages them more and so not only is are the cops there they're breaking down the door the helicopter's there there's a battering ram that an elephant's trying to have sex with a cat is dead it's a madhouse. Ah! Where's Mariah? Get away from my ribs. <laughs> oh, I gotta say, um, they shouldn't have been mad at that kid for mowing the lawn like that. They should have commended him for the effort it took to make that, that in the lawn. That kid, I guarantee you, I mean, if he didn't become a full-blown serial killer, runs a very successful landscaping business. <laughs> yeah. he like I thought Edward Scissorhands was impressive. I mean, that shit was... Oof. Um, but yeah, and then, but then, but don't worry, because... I, I, everything's wrapped up so neatly, but like, I also wanted them to just kill the house guests at this point. When they, Cause it seems like they're going to like their big revenge moment in the finale of the movie. I'm like, just murder them. And you know what? They kind of almost do. Con- almost. Uh, John Larroquette was going to. He Jonathan doesn't die, but I mean, come on, he died. <laughs> he gets blown up well, in a car. So like, okay. So oh. on, after all of this, and uh, John Larroquette has has dumped out the cocaine on his neighbor's gravel driveway. He goes to get his wife at the at the news channel, and she doesn't want to leave. She just wants to live on the set of this cooking show, and, and they they could sleep uh, on one of the sets from the soap operas. She says we're going to be the phantoms of the of Channel Twelve, mm-hmm. and just live here because there's no house guests. But he talks her down, and they go back, and it's day fifty. And it's the day of reckoning. Uh, they go in and they have the showdown with Bernice because surprise, she's not pregnant. Her uh, they she had she had Jesse Kirstie Alley FedEx her pee to her doctor in New Jersey who ran a test and said there must have been a mix up. You're not pregnant. Mm-hmm. She's getting the boot so much so that they actually literally defenestrate her like <laughs> out onto the front lawn. She almost dies. Hit, yeah, she almost hits a pike through her head. Okay, there, there's, so yeah, if this if this were a horror movie, she would have been impaled on something. Oh, for sure, a hundred percent. Um, but but that's, like straight up <laughs> attempted murder of Jonathan. Like, there's no two ways about it. And they're like, okay, so now it's time to clean house. Uh, everybody realizes that they have snapped. Because at this point, they are no longer living in their own house. They are yard people eating pigeons. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they they are like, that's it. She's not pregnant. We're getting rid of these people. They try to, like, close and lock the doors so they can't get in. Of course, they break the windows to get in. They kick open the doors. For some reason, they yell, company! Yeah, that was weird. And then just start kicking ass. John Larroquette picks up a circular saw and starts coming after the paper chase guy. Like, he's gonna, like, like stick it in his chest and just, like, fucking straight up murder him Jason Voorhees style. He doesn't because the cord becomes unplugged. But, hey, you know what? The 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 couple that murders together stays together. Kirstie Alley plugs him in and gives him all kinds of extension cord they can chase him around the hose with, with, with the circular saw. Yeah, it's... It, like... <sighs> If they had not been successful in getting away, this would have been several murders. I think they should have just done it. Fuck it. Just end the I mean, she goes murders. upstairs and she starts just spray painting her sister's wardrobe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, was kind of satisfying, actually. Everybody 
they clean house literally on every mm-hmm. single person. Jonathan though throws a wrench into their into their plan because he comes in with a gun and he's like, you know, I'm taking I'm taking give me your keys, give me your keys and they give him the keys to to paper chase guys, one of one of his uh his Lotus. Lotus, yeah. Yeah. Um but they also <laughs> why does he have a bomb like Okay, so here's what happens. Out of his bag? This is what happens. It's it's the sociopaths, it's little Dahmer's book oh, bag. Oh, okay. Also, uh little Dahmer, I'm surprised I mean, could have been a Saturday morning cartoon <laughs> that I would have watched. That's awful. Lil Dahmer, L I apostrophe L, Lil Dahmer. That uh, <laughs> that should have been the Evan Peters show. Never mind seeing like Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes. We know what happened. Give us Lil Dahmer. <laughs> Give us Lil Dahmer. Um, it's his book bag, and he that he has a fascination with fireworks and explosives. Right. So Larroquette takes the uh, the coke whatever is left over it because I thought he sprinkled it on the fucking driveway puts it in the book bag um and then like cuz they're doing all this kind of like I don't know they're they're doing some real David Copperfield shit where they're like they're sleight of handing him mm-hmm. and they give him that book bag he while he's doing the whole you know sleight of hand stuff he hands Kirstie Alley a a, a, a lighter uh, and then he gives the guy the, the, he gives Jonathan the Lotus keys. And as he's turning to go, she lights the fuse. Apparently it's a Yosemite Sam fuse. The, oh yeah. Because it takes forever it, to reach. It the blows payload. up when it's convenient to the plot. Uh, no, it blows up when it's convenient not to blow up a Lotus. That's true. When it's <laughs> off camera. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But again, he's dead. Like he's dead. He's dead, but he's not. But he's because not. Because the, the cops catch him. But he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got like and, cartoon like soot in his face exactly uh because the after that happens the the cops show up john larroquette is at this point he is on top of the uh d- delightfully appointed uh s- spanish tile roof uh that they have <laughs> he is threatening to burn it down and then logan paul showed up of course he was just a little bitty baby at the time but it was great right and he but he had that he had that other baby dressed in the in the uh the sports drink bottle <laughs> right. i thought it was i thought it was weird how john larroquette splashed that baby through a table i mean that was a little extreme <laughs> Dude, the, the 80s were a wild time. <laughs> Come on, how many babies got splashed through tables in the 80s? <laughs> I mean, are you looking at, like, you know, regionally, like, or just overall, like, a number? Because, I mean, I'm going to say, on average, four or five a week. Okay. A lot, a lot of, I mean, it was, dude, the 80s, they were wild, man. Baby splashing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, The cat still alive uh the reason why the cops have showed up is because uh they've been told to go issue an apology for <laughs> basically destroying the house uh and they have been said that we were we are going to pay for all of the damages and repairs um and uh the criminal investigation is now kaputsky because the only hard evidence they had the dead cat that they put in an evidence bag and locked in the evidence locker is no longer there because the cat is still fucking alive <laughs> It's a it's a it's a huge Deus Ex Machina here. They just show <laughs> up and they're like, "And we'll pay for it all." Yep. And uh, so everything gets kind of gets, you know, kind of. It even gets wrapped up even more so because we 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 did fail to mention the the cigar jumping hard ass client that Larroquette he picked his stocks for him and it was picked this company. It wasn't Electrolux, but it was similar sounding. Yeah. They were going. They were nosediving. Every time you turn around, this this stock was taking a plunge. But because he was so preoccupied with what was going on in the house, he couldn't sell off the stock. And the, the, the client was absolutely just taking a bath on this stock. But then all of a sudden, the the, the fraud charges against the company were go were dismissed. Uh, they picked up more contracts with the U.S. government and their stock went through the roof. The guy shows up at the end to say, you're a genius and I want you to work for me at four times your salary. And, of course, not only does this mean he's going to make four times his salary, uh, Jesse's sister takes notice of it. And he's, she's like, he's not over 80, so I'll have sex with him in his Rolls Royce because my son is going to jail. It's And they leave, so we've gotten rid of Jonathan. Yeah, We've gotten rid of... Uh, the sister. We've gotten rid of the sister. 
uh, Bernice and, and Freddie are going to be leaving because Bernice is not pregnant and can now travel. Although apparently they're going to drive cross country. And apparently, I mean, listen, Bernice is obviously portrayed as a villain, but apparently she's just going to live in a life of silence for the rest of her life. Cause as they're leaving, he says, what did I say, honey? No talking. Now, no more, uh, no more yapping, no more yapping. And I was like, so you can talk, just stop yapping. Yeah. And I don't, what, I guess what's going to happen with paper chase and his, you know, two deviant kids. They're left out in the cold, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, because they're all gone. And, uh, so finally our delightful couple is now back to enjoying the peace and silence of their absolutely destroyed home. They, they lay down in their, in their bed. Disgusting. To... Clean those sheets. That's where Bernice <laughs> was for this whole movie. <laughs> so, and before they could they could get down to to making any of that 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 sweet eighties untrimmed bush love, uh, John Larrick cat goes and smashes the toilet because it's still running because even in their most deepest darkest desperate hours those house guests would not jiggle the handle. Uh, we get a couple of credits afterwards that uh, they do very well. Uh, he works for the guy. Kirstie Alley writes a book. They both do great. Uh, they get a new place, and they do fantastic until their parents come to visit. The where are they now credits are so weird when it's in a fictional movie. It's yeah, know, so right? bizarre. Uh, also, like how they basically just tell you that Kirstie Alley basically becomes Howard Beale from Network at the end of the movie because her crazed yeah. rant <laughs> makes her like a star. She gets her own gig, yeah. yeah, like her own television show. Oh, and also they get the cat. That's the cat's redemption arc, is that he feels so right. bad for this couple that he comes up, Kirstie Alley's terrified, and then he's just like, nope, he's our cat now. <laughs> right, because, yeah, he wouldn't, at first, when she first met him, she, he reached out of the, the cat carrier and, oh, and scratched her. her. Absolutely, yeah, it's destroyed her dress. Yeah. And then she does it does the same thing to Bernice at the end of the movie, and they're like, uh, we think he's run through about four of his lives. He's welcome to jo have the rest of them with us here, and we'll be keeping them. Yeah, keeping yeah. Him. yeah, he's a cute cat. Yeah. So everyone's just going to go off and continue to be awful as the 90s roll on ahead of them at a, you know, a, the freight train pace. <laughs> that was Brendan. Brendan did not care for this movie. <laughs> he, those are his notes going away all right well uh you know what uh despite the uh, the slight sound spoiler there brendan would you say that this is worth a watch a drunk watch with friends would you attempt head trauma to forget this movie or are you just gonna tell people to avoid it like the plague uh i would probably attempt head trauma i'm not gonna go full tilt to avoid like the plague i, I just want i've never gotten to do the notes crumple sound effect and i actually wrote my notes this time so it was fun <laughs> Um, no, I, I would say head Cathartic, trauma. Cathartic, isn't it? It is. Because <laughs> um, every time I crumple up my computer, it, it causes issues. <laughs> I um, have to go buy a new one. <laughs> this is, uh, it's 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 just, you know, I just realized I crumpled my low haiku. <laughs> <laughs> I better uncrumple these notes. Maybe, oh, so maybe it is a drunk watch with friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that this... Um, it's just one of those like zany comedies that's not really all that funny, I guess, in my opinion. Um, it's it's got two capable leads, um, and a lot of very by the numbers jokes, very tropey tropes, and it it at times I not actually, enough Dennis Miller for you, not enough, definitely not enough Dennis Miller. Um, and at times though, honestly, I it dragged like I, for a ninety minute movie, it it definitely dragged in parts. So. I will say, yeah, I would just attempt head trauma to forget it. What about you, pal? Well, I'm actually going to say a, a drunk watch with friends, but again, I think I, I think I have more of an active memory of the '80s, so I can appreciate kind of like the other, like other media that would have been similar to this. So I think it strikes a little bit more nostalgia with me. That's fair. No. It's hard. It's, sometimes it's hard for me to separate when when it, when nostalgia's <laughs> involved, unless it's yep. Masters of the Universe, which I now recognize as a giant turd. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> God. But yeah, 
So okay, yeah, that's it. That's that was our uh, that was that was Madhouse. Bye, everybody. That no, no, oh. no, no. Just uh, stick around. Oh, okay, You're down okay. the league. Of, don't, don't, look, don't touch the dial oh. because things have dials because it's the '80s. Right. Remember, yeah. right? Okay. We're just gonna take a break. It's just a break. Right. It's a little break. We're gonna take it. We're gonna pay some bills and we'll be right back. All right, I'm just gonna unplug my computer real quick. What were they thinking? Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. And we are... Putting on our our best best NPR voices uh, because it's that uh, that time of the the episode where we we like to get a little uh, a little poetical. Uh, it's time now for the low haiku. Yes, and uh, uh, Brendan, for any possible new listeners out there or uh, folks who are living the nightmare that Drew Barrymore did in Fifty First Dates, <laughs> explain to them what the low Haiku is all about. <laughs> I was just thinking about that, no word of a lie, last night. <laughs> For some reason, it popped into my head, and I just remembered what a, uh, uh, at first seems romantic, and when you think about it for two minutes, terrifying nightmare world. A walking nightmare, yes. <laughs> Good movie, though. Um, yes, uh, the low haiku is uh, 17 perfect syllables that we uh, like to bestow upon our listeners um, that kind of sum up the movie we just uh, talked about. Okay, all right. And um, as I was the, as I was leading this uh, charge, mm-hmm. uh, I will defer to you to, uh, to, to grace us with your low haiku first. <clears throat> Kirsty, crushing it. Laraquette, doing his best. Movie zany. Ugh. Oh, very good, very good. It's interesting. Like uh, your haiku actually spells out a, a, a recipe um, for what should be a good movie, as as does the the general, you know, the broader things or uh, the bones of this this movie should be should be good. I like I like zany when there's when there's jokes that i haven't seen eight million times right 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 uh okay. a little na- hacky a little, 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 little hack it's hacky hacky sacky yeah that's what they call it right that's what they did in the 80s oh hacky sack, hacky sack. there we go that's yeah it's callback uh nathan uh would you like to read your low haiku i do and um that little misty's out there might uh might recognize this mm-hmm. uh, we'll play but... some misty for us oh no misty's mystery science theater yeah course. oh i know Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, it's the eighties. Do a lot of coke and vote for Ronald Reagan. Thank you, wow. thank you, and, and thank you to Michael J. Nelson uh, for the uh, the lyrics. Big one eighty uh, from your Reagan stance earlier. I, uh, you know what? Um, it's just a statement on the eighties in general, not my person. Just go back in time and vote for Ronald Reagan. See what happens. And uh, so with that, we are just going to...
Whew. How's I mean, we gotta we gotta talk to Milos about getting NPR bought something like, fixed. Something. Yeah. I you know what he could do? He could get him fixed and put in we could we could put like Steven Seagal traps around Okay. The around the studio. So like mouse so traps, that, but that they just have pieces of cake. Right. Then they're like really, really big. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they and they have a sign that says these are not Steven Seagal traps. Right, because he he would see that and go, oh, it's okay, it's not it's not a Steven Seagal. Oh, wait, trap. wait, I just made the assumption that he can read. <laughs> <It's> silly me. <laughs> so what you're saying is people read his scripts so he can memorize them. Uh, I'm assuming, or the cue cards are like pop up books. They're just like pictures, and he tries his best oh. to say what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that one's a little bit country, and that one's a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, well, you know what we've uh, we we've we've waxed poetic. Mm. Uh, we have talked about uh, the finer points of the uh, of this movie, as chaotic as it may have sounded. All of that happened. There was just there's not enough time in the world to to break that thing down beat by beat. That's what it is. Uh, but we don't want you guys to think that we are the arbiters of good taste and that we are the be all and end all of what you should be doing so much so that we want you guys to think for yourself that we tell you, you know, this, this thing that we, that we say around here, we've been saying it for years. And what's that thing that we've been saying for years, Brendan? Well, that thing that we say is. Don't take a word for us. That's right. Don't take our word for it. Uh, you know, Brendan, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that because Larroquette and Kirstie Alley, I mean, stalwarts of 80s sitcoms. Mm-hmm. And I mean, let's 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 absolutely be honest Two fine comedic actors in their own right. You know, format be damned. Right. So the critics must have loved this movie. Uh, not a one out of the seven critics that reviewed this movie the seven reviews they were able to obtain uh zero percent of them liked this movie oh oh but i mean night court and cheers right huge huge fan base i mean so i mean the fans like me thinking like you know kirstie allen and mm-hmm. john larrakat in the movie together i gotta i gotta see that that they must have they must have showed out in droves and loved this thing it's got to be a very Mario Brothers movie esque type situation. Um, so no to the showing up in droves apparently, and no to the overwhelming uh, love because only about five hundred plus ratings, and forty five percent of them liked it. Oh dear me! Yeah, but Nathan, I get I've got some good news for you. Um, mm-hmm. If you found some enjoyment out of this movie, you may also enjoy these movies. Uh, Nobody's fool, which also has a zero percent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a movie called Greedy with Michael J. Fox. I've seen that. Uh, Soul Man, which we may have to do one day. I I feel like it has to happen. <laughs> it, it 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 crawled so Loquisha could walk. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Dick, a movie about uh, Jenna Elfman and I think it's Jenna Elfman and Kirsten Dunst to become like dog walkers for Richard Nixon. Apparently, it's pretty funny. Um, and of course, uh, Calendar Girl starring Jason Priestley, who is pretty nice in real life. Cause I got to talk to him on the phone one time and it was cool. Cool. I can't, I right. can't say this. I can't say why he is good on air. Um, uh, oh. but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. It was a good time. He's a very, he's a very sweet, nice gentleman. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, uh, Priestley pleasantness aside let's uh let's get into the uh the critics because i actually think we i think we we've, we've got this pretty split there's only four that we could actually read here on the tomatoes so let's uh let's just burn right through them yeah and and i'll say the first one here of course my boy roger ebert of the chicago sun times he says this movie is mostly merely priestly pleasant on a few occasions it's very funny but it never quite goes over the top and gets the big laughs it is obviously aiming for two out of four okay well, Scott Weinberg of eFilmCritic.com, uh, back in 2002, apparently wrote, "It's like a sitcom exploded onto the big screen." 
Yeah, that's, one out of five. I mean, that's a fair a fair summation. <laughs> Uh, Juan Carlos Coto, the Miami Herald, says Madhouse is the dime store equivalent of Louis Bunuel's The Exterminating Angel, or Mother, about dinner guests who can't bring themselves to leave a house and end up starving. Well, it's a different plot for that movie, but yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and finally, um, Rene Jordan of El Nuevo Herald out of Miami writes... The film crosses the line so much, after a while, the accumulation of catastrophes is fatiguing. Okay. Well, That's all the uh, reading ones that we can do. That's all the critics. Let's go into the audience reviews. The audience. Um, okay, let's see here. Okay, well, the, I think they're all from Neil Breen. I'm just going to preface that right now. I think all of okay. these reviews are from Neil Breen. But this one is a four-star review. It says, my favorite parts are cat eating cocaine and don't you choke my cherub. Don't you choke my cherub. And where the lady goes flying out the window in her wings of the night nightgown. I only remember a few details because I saw this when I was like nine. <laughs> the don't choke my cherub. That was the uh, that was the husband. That was the the off screen oil magnate. Ah, uh, right, 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 when, right, right, yeah, right, right. When right. the yeah, when she shows up, he has all like the security. That was and the stuff. F- that was one of his, the funniest parts for him. I guess. Okay. I mean. Obviously, the it's a, it's an entendre for choking something. Right. Else. No. Oh, wh- what? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my first one comes from uh, Russell H. In Russell Crow. There you go. And he writes, "I didn't mind it. Very stupid, but I love Dan Fielding. <laughs> Two and a half out of stars. <laughs> I can't even say his name. Uh, okay. Um." This one is a four and a half stars. This movie is crazy. It's funny, though. That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Neil Breen uh, wrote, A decent sitcom, too. Four out of stars. Wow. Um, okay, this one is a negative review from Neil Breen. Um, and he says, Rivals the never-ending story, too, as my least essential theatrical viewing experience. Still, I miss the days when John Larroquette could have been considered, however incorrectly, a viable leading man for a feature film. My weakness for broad comedies in which property is needlessly destroyed prevents me from hating it with any real vigor, but it's still a big pile of bad-smelling crap. As opposed to good-smelling crap, I guess? One and a half stars. That's, I don't think that's fair. I think Larrick get. I think Larrick got a raw deal. I think he could have been a really good. Yeah, I guess leading we, man. I mean, it's hard to tell with this movie, you know. Uh if you he did a turn on, I believe it was Boston Public in the no, not Boston Public, Boston Legal, in the two thousands, and the guy he has chops for drama, mm-hmm. but he just he he likes comedy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's stuck with his wheelhouse, and I'm guessing he saved his night court money. So, he could pick and choose and, and just, you know, not work and whenever he decided sort of thing. Yeah. Just speculating. But anyways, my next one comes from Neil Breen, and he writes, Like the worst television sitcom turned into a really dumb movie about a bunch of people who never leave, and then Christy Alley's shirt bursts open for no reason at the end. Half out of stars. So Christie Alley's shirt bursting open gets it a half star, I guess. Wow, I mean that's at least three stars for me. Um, that's my pervert review of uh, the movie. Uh, <laughs> okay, my last review comes from Neil Breen, and he says I love this movie, and I can't find it anywhere on DVD. I'm starting to get upset. Five stars. <laughs> Someone get this guy a DVD copy. He's gonna murder somebody. He's not wrong though. Like I think this is on Tubi, but I don't think it's really like I don't think it's uh, in print. It never got. I don't believe it ever got re-released. No, no, no. I don't ever recall seeing it on DVD or anything like that. No. I think. This all right. Is, also, I think this is this, that was actually posted by the Hulk. That's why he gets angry all the time. He <laughs> keeps remembering that Madhouse doesn't have an official DVD release. Find Madhouse <laughs> anywhere. We get Animal House. We get House. Where's my Madhouse? Uh. All right. Jesus. Neil Breen had a lot to say about Neil this Breen's, movie. Like he, it's just all Neil Breen. It is. It's 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 a it's a Breenapalooza. 
uh, because my last one comes from Neil Breen. Oh, okay. And um, he writes, Along the same lines of Christmas Vacation, this movie is about a married couple who just buys a new home, and before they know it, it is overrun with unwanted house guests. There are some humorous moments, but overall, the writing is pretty weak. Kirstie Alley and John Larroquette do an adequate job, but the supporting cast that is dreadful and a little too obnoxious to be believable. The potential to make a great comedy was there, but it just fell short. One of those movies that you watch when there's nothing else on and you want to be mildly entertained. Two out of stars. I never actually made that that that, I, that slight connection with the whole Christmas vacation thing. Yeah, unwanted house guests that won't leave. I get it. Well, yeah, but aren't they kind of wanted, though? I mean, they know they're coming. Not by, not by Clark. Not by Clark. He's too busy hitting on <laughs> the young girl at the makeup counter. Clark is not a good guy. Um, nope. Just like everybody else in this movie. Yeah. Doesn't he like? <laughs> doesn't he like full on or like very nearly cheat on his wife in vacation? Like he meets somebody at a pool and then she doesn't show up or something. Possibly, I think so. I think because in Christmas vacation, I'm like, oh, this is mild for old Clark, a uh, homewrecker Griswold. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Well, there you go. That's it. So yeah, that's that's it. That's uh, you know, we that's what the the critics and the audience had to say. So. We're just going to go ahead and we're going to put uh, Madhouse in our rear view. Ooh. And we are going to talk about some things that we, you know, that that we like for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for the dance craze sensation that's sweeping the nation. It's the what you watching, bud. What you watching, bud. I don't know what you're watching, but I'll tell you so. Do, 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 do. So, Brendan. Yep. What you watching, bud? What am I watching? Well, uh, over the last mm, month and a half, maybe. I don't know how long it took me to watch this, but there's only three seasons. So I'm going to recommend I'm going to recommend two things, but they're tied in together. Um, I watched the entire series of Deadwood. Uh, great, great, great HBO show. Um, if you like westerns, if, uh, I guess also known as Swearwood, <laughs> very much so, cocksucker. Um, it's it's, uh, it's anybody not familiar with the show would be like, why did Brendan just call Nathan a cocksucker? Because <laughs> Brendan's a rude dick. Yeah, not all Canadians are are super polite and happy guys. Deal with it. Yeah, just like fuck off, cocksuckers. Okay. Um, but Deadwood is, uh, it's a little bit, it's got some Western, obviously it takes place in like the re it, it it's a, it's based on the real town of Deadwood, um, which, um, had no laws governing it for, for a while. They had no statehood. Um, it's a great, great show. Ian McShane as Al Swearingen is a legendary performance. <laughs> so good. Timothy Oliphant is in it. He's great. There's lots of other character actors that you'll recognize. There's a couple people from Sons of Anarchy, actually, uh, Nathan. There's a... Uh, uh, Unser shows up as Utter, which I thought was funny that he barely changed his name. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Calamity Jane is played by, don't remember her name, but she plays the gang, the biker gang's lawyer in Sons of Anarchy. So oh, she okay. shows up in this too. She's she's fantastic. So the show is really good. And then I'm also going to recommend that if you watch the show, because it's three seasons and got canceled. So if you watch the show, do watch Deadwood the movie, which came out about 13 years after and does tie up a lot of loose ends and provides a great uh, a, gr a great bit of like you know satisfaction you actually get to see some of these stories wrap up and you get a sense of complete completeness i have a hard time watching shows that i know didn't end on their own terms um oh. but when i heard that there was a movie that fixed that uh, i was like okay i'm going to i'm going to give this a shot so deadwood and deadwood the movie are on crave in canada and they're probably on like hbo max or something in the states so check it out all right, there you go. Um, I'll say this uh, just because you mentioned that this isn't my uh, my what you're watching, but I guess but I guess it's kind of a it's an addition to it now. Uh, the Black Donnellys was uh, was a great show because you mentioned the ones that didn't kind of get to end on their own terms, and this was a, it was a show that was on NBC for a season that ended on a cliffhanger, and uh, it was such a heartbreak 
but it's the the show itself is really good it's about this uh uh this family uh the they've kind of kind of like a history of being ne'er-do-wells but there's one of them who's trying to get out of that and be like an artist and go straight and every turn they it, he keeps getting like knocked down from that and not being able to do it and go back to that life and you know it ends with like this cliffhanger that never get got resolved if you if you want an exercise in frustration check out that show but <laughs> If you want something light, this is the thing that I was actually going to recommend before Brendan, you know, gave me that terrible bit of trauma uh, reminding. Um, Beanie and Cecil. I've been watching a lot of that lately. Uh, it's a cartoon from the 60s. Now, that being said, it's a cartoon from the 60s. <laughs> so if you're going to watch it, be full on prepared that there are going to be some you know, less than culturally sensitive representations of, of minorities. That being said, I, it's not so egregious that it happens every episode and that you're going to be like, Nathan's a racist. <laughs> is, it, is it on an underdog level? Uh, no, actually, because the thing with the underdog, when I when I mentioned the underdog uh, that I'd been watching, uh, that had bumpers, like other cartoons in between that had the Go Go Gophers. And that was, that's super offensive. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to, not going to dance around that yeah but beanie and cecil um mostly i've been watching it on on youtube and mostly it's self-contained it's one of those shows that didn't have like other cartoons by the same producer or the same animator that would go in to make up the half hour it was always uh adventures of beanie and cecil uh so it's not like woody woodpecker where you'd watch a woody woodpecker and then there'd be a chilly willy episode or maybe an andy panda and then another chill uh, woody woodpecker mm-hmm. all being in cecil um the reason why i why, why i'm recommending it is because it is so puntacular like it's i mean there's sure there's a lot of jokes that are there from the like from the 60s and stuff that you may might have to look up if you're willing to do the legwork but most of the time it's just absolutely pun after pun after pun so i mean if that's something that's something that you like and it's something that i really really like you know there's all kinds of free episodes on uh on youtube and there's even uh you can even watch the episodes from the 90s uh that has uh billy west doing the voice of cecil oh so, there you go very good cecil yeah well, there you go. There's your recommendations uh, for this week. There's your homework, folks. Get that done. Get that all watched. You got two shows to watch and a movie. Uh, Nathan, our good friend Montrose Monkington, is he there to say a few parting words? Yes, he is here to pimp his stuff. Just one moment. I mean, I try to be more elegant about it, but yeah, that's what he's You know what? Doing. He's 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 so mean to me when the cameras aren't on and the, the, the you know, the recording's not running so even when the recording's no, no. running he's pretty cr- he's pretty he's still pretty yeah. pretty crummy yeah yeah i mean he, he's he said uh, on several occasions that we both smell yeah um, oh shit he's coming camped. hello it's your good friend montrose monkington the third here and i would just like to invite all of you why are you why are you both looking at me like that no, I mean, like what are you, are you, are you, are you were you two uncouth ne'er-do-wells who bathe infrequently talking about me. Oh, no, 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 no. Nathan, were you talking about it? No, no. No, I wasn't. No, no, no. no. Not, not a word. Good. Keep it that way. <clears throat> now, if you don't mind, I, I I, am your good friend, Montrose Monkington III, and I, I would just like to invite all of you over to my YouTube channel, Montrose Monkington TV, uh, where, where I talk about the graps a lot. Um, uh, you can also... Uh, be friends with me on the Facebook group Montrose Monkington the Third Esquire and friends, uh, and 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 as a friend, if you'd like to, you know, send me a friendly reminder to your friend Montrose uh, on your Twitter devices, you can do so uh, at Montrose the Third. That's the number three R D. Thank you. More later. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm watching you two. Thank you, friend. You're welcome. Okay. Um, well, on that note, Nathan. Is that, a, is that an earshot? Yeah, he's at an earshot. Fucking primate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. Well, on that note, you can find us all over the place. We're we're all on all the socials. Look for not not on the the show the social. Although we've got an appearance coming up, and I just want to let you know on air that it's going to be in two days, and I hope you're ready. Um, but <laughs> we you can find us on uh, Facebook. Uh, just search for us there. We're on Twitter and Instagram at WWTT Podcast. Our home base for the podcast is Age of Radio. Big time! You can go to ageofradio.org slash what were they thinking and find us there or any podcast app. You can just search for us um, and listen to us on there. Um, and you can also find us on T Public, Redbubble, and Patreon.com slash WWTT Podcast. We've got bonus episodes and shit on there, so check that out. But Nathan, I guess uh, I guess as we come to the end here, I just have, I mean, I guess a few questions about this movie. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? I... As the one who has seen it the most, I feel I am the resident Madhouse expert. So, 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 like in the eighties, did like more people really do drugs? Yes, you know, a lot harder. Like a, coke was a huge thing. Nathan, Nathan, mm-hmm. Nathan. Uh, in the eighties, did did people like smoke a bunch? Oh yes, well, it, like the, it, it was. I, you would get it. You would get tickets for not smoking. Oh, oh, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan mm-hmm. was 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 an actor the president? I mean, actor is a pretty strong word in this case. But yes, Nathan, Nathan, was yeah, was it the eighties? What about them? What were they thinking? Buy, sell, sell, low, high, buy, stock bells, ups and downs. It's a rat race, and the rats will win if we don't.